All right. I'm, I just want to focus now on uh, Titus 2, 11 through 15. If someone could read just that section, we'll kind of dig in right there. It's a very rich section describing the, the uh, gospel and its fruit, um, and we'll spend our time on that today. Titus 2, 11 through 15. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Okay, thank you so much. So this is just one of those beautiful sections of summary of Christian doctrine and of the gospel and of its impact on life. Uh, what does this paragraph teach you about what Paul's trying to achieve here in the, in the book of Titus? What is, he, what is he concerned about here as you read these verses? He talks about training, okay. so that's part of it. He's, he, he says he left the word training until we announce ungodliness and worldly passions, and tells us how to do it in a self-controlled and upright manner. Okay. I think, I think drifting. Okay. In other words, don't slowly drift away from what what you're what we've been been exposed to here and. and and who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. Okay, very good. Anyone else? I think it describes the character and purpose of God's saving grace. It's a beautiful answer. What does God's saving grace do to a human being, to an individual? And then also, groups of Christians banded together in a local church. The reason I left you in Crete, keep it simple, was to plant churches with godly leaders. And those churches, based on these verses, should be eager to do what is good. They should be characterized by good, good deeds. The grace of God in Christ should result in a good life defined by the Bible. It should result in a holy life, a life uh, rich in good works. So the church you plant Titus there in Crete, with the godly elders, should be a city on a hill, a light shining in a dark place. No one lights a, a lamp and puts it under a bowl. Instead, he puts it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. So those churches you plant in Crete should be like that. They should be shining with the light of the gospel of God, because Crete is a particularly dark place, and Cretans are dark people. They're not uniquely wicked. They're really not. I mean, we can make humorous jokes about Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons, but does that mean that the Macedonians aren't liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons? No. How about the Corinthians? Are they any better? They're no better. What about the Romans? What about, you know, they're all like that. Romans 3 says we're all like that. All right, but specifically Cretans are that way. Titus, I left you there in Crete to plant churches that will shine the light of the gospel. And in order for that to happen, the Cretan Christians need to live godly lives. They need to understand the connection between the grace of God and, being, and doing good works, being eager to do what is good. So I think that's the big picture. He wants them to understand genuine saving faith results in good works, results in a holy life, openly displayed so that everyone can see. I think that's what he's... And we can prove this. this is again and again, whether older men, older women, younger men, younger women, slaves, all of that, they need to do certain things so that the gospel is made attractive and beautiful. That's how I see it. All right, so let's walk through it. It begins with the statement in verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So let's just zero in on that phrase, the grace of God that brings salvation. How do we understand that phrase? The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared. I circled a, a long time ago and wrote Jesus above it. Okay. So the grace of God has appeared. Yeah. Jesus Christ. We'll get to appear. I want to talk about appear, but yeah, it's Jesus. 
So the grace of God that has appeared is ultimately Jesus. More thoughts on this. The grace of God that brings salvation. He's, because of his grace, he's, he's also calling uh, his, his people together. Mm-hmm. And, and you can see that in a covenant church. That's, that's <clears throat> but his people to be uh, godly people, okay. uh, purified people. Uh, seeking him every day and asking forgiveness, repenting of sins, uh, living a godly life. Amen. Okay, very, very good. Yeah. I would say even before that, it's, it's, uh, it's God's action doing something that he's, he's no, uh, he's no, nobody's compelling him, he's not compelled to do it, but it's by his will and his, okay. his, the love and his nature. Yeah, so now we're getting at a definition of grace, and it's such a common uh, theological matter that we Christians have had a chance to think about grace many times. So this is not the first time you thought about grace. Um, you know, and there are different simple uh, definitions. Simplest definition I've heard is unmerited favor. I think that's partially true. It's not enough. Um, but unmerited, what does that word mean to you? Unmerited favor. Not, not deserved, earned, and it's not earned. Obligatory. It's not obligatory. Didn't have to. God didn't have to do it, and it's not. It's not earned. It's not based on our works. Okay. Uh, anyone else on the concept of grace as unmerited favor? Well, I, I, we've talked about this many times, too, but um, it, it's God giving us what we don't deserve instead of what we do deserve. Okay. So, like I said, the reason I don't like unmerited favor as a comprehensive definition, is it forgets who we were. Like, if you gave a $100 bill to a total stranger, would that be a display of unmerited favor? Yeah. Right? Um, would it be different to give a $100 bill to someone who had destroyed your life in some way in the past, who had slandered you in, in, publicly? Would that be a different matter? Definitely would. Because now you are showing kindness to someone who has hurt you. I mean, you think about the, the Sermon on the Mount. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with them a second mile. Remember that? That second mile is a good display of grace, right? Because that guy forced you, like at gunpoint or, or sword point, to do something you didn't want to do, like a soldier. You can imagine like a Roman soldier forcing you to go one mile. And it's like, all right, you're done. You can drop that pack and go on. It's like, no, I'm going to go the second mile. That second mile is a good display of grace. So it's not mere unmerited favor. You're actually doing good to somebody who hurt you, who has insulted. All right. So why is it important for us to realize who we were in God uh, or to God before we were converted as we understand the concept of grace? What, What were we before the grace of God came to us? Sinners dead in our transgressions and sins. How were we toward God? Enemies. Enemies. We hated him. We were opposed to his kingdom. We were doing what we could to, to hinder it and stop it. So it's not neutral here. It's not simply unmerited favor. That's not enough. So this is a definition I came up with years ago based on this meditation. Uh, grace is a settled determination in the mind of God to do infinite good to those who deserve infinite wrath. That's a comprehensive definition. It's a settled determination in the heart of God. It starts in the God. God has made up his mind to do us good. That's the grace. It's a settled determination. What do you think I mean by that concept of a settled determination? God has made up his mind about it. And he's made up his mind about us, mm-hmm. which begs the question is why? Right. Why would he do what he did for us who did not deserve it? Yeah. And it, talks, it, it brings about his love. He's extended to a people that are not worthy of it. But his grace he's extending so that we will be worthy of it. Mm-hmm. So good. And it's, it, nothing is going to change God's mind on this matter. There's nothing that he can learn. There's nothing that can happen 
There's no persuasion that could come in to get him to change his mind about grace. Because it's coming from himself. It's in his own mind and heart. So settle determination of the mind or heart of God um, to do infinite good. All right, what does that mean? That God wants to do us infinite good. Uh, that ties in within uh, eternity. Okay. Uh, in, the, in the sense that it's not a temporary or a, a, a good that touches us and goes away. It's right. there. It's not only there at a point, but forever. Yeah. Uh, he wants to raise your dead corpse from the grave into a glorious resurrection body and put you in a perfect world where there'll be no more death, mourning, crying, and pain, where you'll be happy forever. That's what he wants to do for you. Right? And what did you deserve? You deserve to be cast out into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth described as the lake of fire. Infinite wrath. That's what you deserved and what did you get? And frankly, my definition doesn't fully cover everything that I could say because it forgets the uh, price tag of all that. Was there a price tag of God's settled determination to do us infinite good who deserve infinite wrath? The death of Jesus. It cost the blood of his son. It's incredible. That's what grace is. That's why John Newton spoke about amazing grace. So the grace of God is God's decision to do us good. And I like that settled determination idea because we are so changeful, aren't we? We're like, we're, we're good on Monday, bad on Tuesday, okay on Wednesday, a little bit better. On, that's us. God's nothing like that. Nothing like that. And so God has made up his mind to do us good. Uh, Jeremiah 31.3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. He's not going to change his mind. He loved you before you were born. And he, he'll love you after you're dead. He loves you. He's made, he's made up his mind. There's nothing going to change that he's settled determination. I, I like what it says in Psalm 23, the 23rd Psalm. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That's settled determination language, isn't it? God is going to pursue me with goodness the rest of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's grace, isn't it? So the grace of God, all right, that brings salvation. Now, what does that word mean to you? Salvation. The grace of God that brings salvation. Has appeared. What's that? Forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins, definitely. Salvation. Does it not imply, the word salvation imply a grave threat or danger? All right? We would use salvation or saved for a grave threat or danger that has been averted like drowning or being on a battlefield in a firefight and you're wounded and your buddy comes at risk of his life and saves your life right or the coast guard guy goes into the water and swims over and pulls you up while you're drowning pulls you up and out and and saves you so i would say Say salvation implies a grave threat. Would you guys agree with that? To use the word save, right? Like uh, you can imagine you, uh, uh, you, you pull your wallet or cell phone out of your pocket and a piece of paper falls to the ground and it's uh, a wrapper for a piece of gum that you got rid of a while ago. You didn't know you still had the wrapper in your pocket. And someone comes along and picks up that empty wrapper and hands it to you. Would you say, thank you, friend, you have saved me? That's ridiculous. There's no saving there. I mean, it's an act of kindness, no doubt, but it, we wouldn't use the word saved or salvation. Well, that right there, that one moment, that was salvation for me. No, you threw it away in the trash once you realized what it was. It almost has no value. All right, so it's an extreme example, but the point is salvation implies a threat, even a grave threat. Okay, what is the grave threat? Eternal damnation. We already talked about it. Eternal damnation. So, Chris, how grave a threat is that? How, how do we understand that, that threat? It is the ultimate threat to our soul. Yeah. Not just our body, but our soul. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree with me that the worst thing that could ever happen to you 
would be to hear from Jesus, the judge of all the earth, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I don't think there's anything worse that you could ever hear. And then what follows? Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside in the darkness. Some angel comes forward, grabs hold of you, ties you up and throws you there. There is nothing more terrible than that. So that is the salvation we're talking about here. But I would expand it. It's not just hell. Salvation is comprehensive. You're saved from everything that sin has done to you or can do to you, and not just to you, but to the world, to the universe, and not just to you, but to a multitude greater than anyone could count from every tribe, language, people, and nation. So it's everything sin has done to his elect and to his beautiful world saved from that. So what has sin done to us? Not just that it's going to send you to hell, but what does sin do to a person, to their mind, to their heart, to their bodies? Think about that. Sin is death. Okay, ultimately you know, death. We get sick, we die. Okay, <laughs> aging, sickness, all right? Worry. Worry, Anx anxiety, worry. What does it do to relationships? Tears them apart. Tears them apart, all right? I mean, honestly... If, if you are married to a Christian woman, genuine, genuine Christian woman, and either you or her were perfectly conformed to Christ and the other wasn't, but still a genuine Christian, how much would that marriage improve? Just one of you, perfectly conformed to Christ, dealing with every situation exactly as Jesus would have done. How much would that marriage improve? <laughs> Wouldn't matter if it's her or you. Just that one of you would be perfected and the other one just merely born again. It would be immeasurably better. So let me ask again, what has sin done to your marriage? Think about it. What's caused all the trouble you've ever had in your marriage? Her sin and yours. Not just hers, not just yours. But you've worked at it together to make your marriage less than it should have been. That's all. And we know that. And it's like, like I'm not trying to be too hard. I'm married to him. I'm a married man. I know that. I'm just telling you, sin has damaged that relationship. Same thing with your kids, relationship with your kids. Same thing. Uh, your friends, church members. It just does damage everywhere. Salvation is a rectification. It heals all that. It, it, it solves that problem. It's pretty awesome. So when we look at the word salvation, it's a big word, isn't it? It's a comprehensive word. The grace of God that brings salvation. God's intention is to save you. And he will do it. That's pretty awesome. Now we get to the word you mentioned, appeared. Now the grace of God that brings salvation. All right, wait a minute. Before we get to that, to all men. What, do you, what does that mean to you? Has appeared to all men. We'll get to appear in a minute, but all men. All people. Let's go with people. It's not just men, but people. All people. It came the first time. Okay. Talking about Jesus coming. It wasn't done in secret. It wasn't done in secret. Appeared. So we'll get. I want to unfold. Appeared. But I want to talk about all people here. Well, it's not a specific group. It's everybody. Every single person. That's what the word all was there for. I mean, that's why in the Bible it says he's all knowing, all comforting. Well, not all, all isn't always the same, if I can say to you theologically. There, there's sometimes that all means every single solitary one in a group, and other times it just means different categories. All kinds of people. Do you think it's more all kinds, or is it every single person that's ever drawn breath on earth? The elect. It's definitely the elect, okay? So maybe we need to do appeared and all men kind of together, all right? Um, I guess what I'm getting at is it can't be every single solitary person that's ever lived because are there people that are born, live, and die without ever having heard of Jesus? Well, you know, millions, if not billions. So the grace of God that brings salvation didn't appear to them. They never heard about it. Never heard about it. And we know that there is a category of people who never heard of Jesus because of Romans 10, right? How then can they call on one they have not believed in and how can they believe in someone of whom they've never heard? So there are people who have never heard of Jesus. All right, so there's no doubt about that. So what does the word appeared mean to you? The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared. 
for those that have heard are really blessed beyond belief. Okay. Because they have an opportunity to live a godly life, and when they don't, they have repentance, they have asking for forgiveness, and leading to a godly life and to an end and to thy will. Okay. <clears throat> As appeared means that to me it wasn't it wasn't done in secret. Okay. It wasn't veiled or anything, you know, it was it was it was there. Was it a secret at one point? Was it concealed at one point? Yes. Where was it concealed? In the mind of God. And he kind of paid it out, paid and revealed it a little at a time. Turn to Romans 16, and uh, Romans 16, I think, is a good partner for this word appeared that we're looking at right now. Romans 16, very last paragraph, very, very last paragraph of Romans. Can someone read Romans 16, 25 to 27, just the very last paragraph of Romans? Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel in the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery did belong to his past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings of the man of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To be the only wise God before forever to Jesus Christ. Amen. Now that, thank you, is a paragraph, friends. How long would it take to walk through all that? Well, we're not doing Romans today, but I want to I want to show you some of the richness of this. Uh, basically, it's now to him, God, who is able to establish you by my gospel, and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, the preaching of Jesus Christ. Now it says, according to the revelation of the mystery, what? Hidden. Hidden. For how long? long? Long ages past. But now, what? Revealed. See what I'm saying? So this, this salvation was hidden for a long time. And it was concealed in the mind of God. God knew before the foundation of the world what he was going to do. But the world didn't know about it. And at a certain point, he revealed it. Now, he revealed it little by little before Jesus was ever born in the prophetic writings by Isaiah or by Jeremiah or by Moses, uh, you know, the Old Testament prophecies, right? But now, so go back to Titus. I, I'm just, I just did that because of the idea of a mystery hidden for long ages past but now revealed and made known. So now you go back to Titus and it says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Revealed. It is now seen like light in Chelsea. Right. So it's a revelation. It's like a revelation or an unveiling of Jesus. It's an unveiling of Jesus. Go ahead, Ted. Would you call it an ordered revelation of hidden secrets? Yeah, I like it. An ordered revelation of hidden secrets. God has a lot of secrets. There's a lot of things we have to learn. And there's a learning to it, right? The revelation is progressive. It's little by little. I had an interesting thought, all right? This is really cool. I was thinking about that first resurrection night. I know, Chris, how much John 20 means to you. And you remember how Jesus comes through the locked door and says, peace be with you and all that, shows them his hands and his side. And it says they were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now, I want to... I wanna, understand their joy at that moment. It says they, they couldn't believe it for joy in Luke. So there's a joy there. I want to ask you, that first night, how much do you think they understood his reason for dying on the cross? I still don't think they knew it. Then what were they joyful about? That he's alive. They couldn't quite figure it out. They knew he was dead. So they're joyful about resurrection. Are they joyful about substitutionary atonement by his blood? They don't understand it. They didn't understand it. That's why Peter wanted to fight to save him from going to the cross. And the, the, the Friday night, Saturday, and then Sunday morning didn't solve that. Now, the 40-day seminary that followed, and that probably solved it. So by the time Peter's getting up on Pentecost, I think he got it by then. 
but I don't think they understood blood atonement yet. They're just happy to see him. <laughs> they just gave him a hug. They're happy to see him. They're like, oh, you're alive. We're back together again. It's like, yeah, you don't really understand. But Jesus is like, it's fine. It's fine. We'll get to it. <laughs> He's just, you know, and we're all like that. We don't fully understand Jesus. We don't fully understand the salvation. It's a progressive work. Do you think any of you, even on the day you die, will understand salvation as well as you will when you get to heaven? No chance. You're going to get a quantum leap in understanding when you are glorified. Right now, you have a working knowledge of it, right? It's good enough, good enough to get you to heaven, but it's incomplete, just like the disciples that first night, incomplete. And Jesus is so patient. He's just happy to look at my hands and my side. Thomas wasn't there. We'll circle back with Thomas a week later. We'll get him taken care of and all that. But, and then we'll get to the blood atonement. We'll get to why I had to die for you. They definitely understood. By the time Peter wrote his epistle, he understood. You know that it was not with silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you, but by the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. By the time he wrote those words, did he get it? Oh, yeah, he got it. But not that first night. I don't think so. Can, can I ask? Yeah. What about now? When uh -huh. somebody comes to the saving knowledge yeah. of Jesus, What's understood? Enough. <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I'm not God. I, I'm not their judge. It's just. It's. It's like it's enough, but it's not complete. Yeah. And you know, like like uh, John one with Nathaniel. Remember when he's under the fig tree, and then then uh, he comes to Jesus later, and and he says, "Now Nathaniel, here's a true Israelite in whom there is no guile." And Nathaniel's like, "How do you know me?" said, well, while you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And what does Nathanael say? Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. And Jesus is like, really? You know, because I said I saw you under the fig tree, you say I'm the son of God, the king of Israel. You're going to see greater things than that. <laughs> so what it is, is there's a partial knowledge there, but there's this dimmer switch going on. And you know what's so cool about heaven? That dimmer switch is going to go on forever. Forever, there's more to learn about the greatness of God in Christ, isn't there? Christ is an infinite being. So none of us, none of us is complete with it. Isn't that sweet? And so that's why, like, even today, we're doing Titus 2, 11 and following, and there's, like, new insights, nothing radically new. If it were radically new, I'd be a heretical false teacher, all right? But it's like, yeah, this is really kind of cool. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared, and is manifest, and little by little, we're understanding it, right? Little by little, we're getting it. And it brings salvation, it's appeared to all men. No, not every single person. We are not universalists. What does that mean, universalist? Or what is universalism? It implies that uh, something applies to you because you're breathing. <laughs> okay. So if you're a human being, what does universalism teach about you? If you're a human being, what? Recovered. Meaning what? You're, safe. you're going to go to heaven when you die. Right. Yeah, it's what uh, R.C. Sproul called justification by death. All right? You go to any average funeral, it teaches basically justification by death, right? The person's dead, they're in heaven playing golf with their golf buddies. I mean, that's, that's the mentality. Well, that's clearly false. We do, we're not universalists. And neither do we believe that everyone in the world gets the same amount of truth. Some people live immersed in gospel truth, surrounded by good teaching, surrounded by sound doctrine and all that their whole lives. Other people live and die never having heard the name of Jesus, never having heard his name. But still, the display has appeared now in Jesus for the entire world. Jesus is the Savior. Yeah. We say this display is a starting point uh -huh. for us to work in our salvation. Yeah. Not our works, but... Yeah. Salvation comes a little bit. We yeah. learn. Mm -hmm. We learn. That's what it is. It's a manifestation of God. Ralph, you're going to say something? I just brought the thought of you're not, you're not fully saved until uh, you're with Jesus. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's got to be a process. Yeah, salvation is a process. Justification's not. It materializes over time. Yeah, little by little, 
you know, with good sound Bible teaching and the work of the Holy Spirit and having, uh, you know, your quiet time, February 29th, Isaiah 40, spend the day in Isaiah 40, awesome. Uh, and you see some things, more things about God and about Jesus, and I love Isaiah 40. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers them in his arms and gently leads those that have you. It's just so beautiful. Awesome. So it's like something, and it's just so beautiful, and, and it's just a, a work of salvation inside you. That's what's going on. All right, let's keep going. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, verse 12. It teaches us, this is my translation, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. That's NIV 84. Any other translation on that between 11 and 12? What does 12 say? Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Training us to renounce. All right, so let's, I like that. Training or teaching, that seems to be pretty much synonyms. So what does the teaching here, what teaches and what trains us to renounce ungodliness? You have to connect verse 11 and 12. What does the teaching? It. It. And what's the it? Salvation. I'm, I'm sitting here. It's the grace of God. It's grace, yeah. So for the grace of God that brings salvation to all men. But it could be salvation. But I think it's grace. Grace is a teacher. Grace is a teacher. Grace teaches you. But what does it teach here in verse 12? What does the grace of God that brings salvation teach? To turn from the godliness to worldly passion. Right. So that's not a once saved, always saved, doesn't matter how you live theology here. It's if the grace of God in Christ comes into you, you're going to increasingly renounce wickedness. That's what it's saying. This is a holiness verse, right? The grace of God trains you or teaches you to renounce wickedness. How does it do that? So we're not going to renounce wickedness unless we're in a Bible teaching fellowship with covenanted believers mm -hmm. so that we can learn Scripture as the Bible teaches us how to live a godly life. Amen. Yeah, the teaching is essential. So in order to renounce wickedness, you have to have two things, right? You have to know what wickedness is, that something is wicked and you have to hate it, and then you make a decision against it, right? How does teaching, good Bible teaching, identify wickedness and teach you to hate it? Okay, it convicts you, all right? It teaches the good, so you have something to compare your behavior to. Yeah. The standard yeah. truth. Yeah, I, I would refer to this last week, but let's take an example of something you may not think of when you think of wickedness, all right? We talked about it a little last week, and we talked about it many times before. Would you say that murmuring and complaining against circumstances is wickedness? Oh, yeah. Complaining about your life circumstance, would you call that wickedness? I don't think most Christians would. I think they would like, well, that's a problem. It's a bad habit. Would, do you think the Bible would call it wickedness? Yeah. yeah. I think it would. It happened for 40 years when Moses just led them out of bondage, and they complained about it. All right, well, let's take an example. Do you guys remember after the 12 spies and all that, they're back in, they're beginning their 40-year sentence of wandering in the desert, and um, they're eating manna every day? Do you remember when they complained about the manna? Bad quail. All right, no, manna. Do you remember they complained about the manna? What happened? What did God do? Do you guys remember the bronze serpent story? Yeah. He sent serpents. He sent poisonous desert snakes to do what? What were the snakes there to do? Kill people. So what does that teach you about complaining about the food you're eating? Probably shouldn't do it. Probably shouldn't do it. <laughs> okay. That's a good answer, all right? I was like, probably shouldn't do it. Maybe you should thank God for the food, right? Give thanks to God for this. Don't mur So I, as I was working on my contentment book, I started to see murmuring and complaining as a wicked thing. I really hadn't seen it that way. So a good teaching church will teach you that murmuring and complaining against God is wickedness. It's not just a bad habit. I mentioned earlier, um, and we're talking about it earlier even today, but talked about marriage, and it says, husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. What does the word harsh mean? To be harsh with your wife. Dictatorial. Okay, dictatorial, tyrannical, maybe. What else? Harsh. Huh? Unfair. Unfair, unkind, 
unloving. Right, and probably the number one organ of harshness is the tongue, like James says, saying, cutting things to her, <laughs> insulting things. Let me ask a question. Is that kind of harshness wickedness yeah. or ungodliness? It is. But you didn't maybe think it was, or you didn't identify it. And so what Lynn is saying is absolutely true. You need good, sound teaching to identify wickedness, and then the verse says, renounce it. What does renounce mean? To renounce, I'm going to renounce being harsh to my wife. Don't do it anymore. I'm going to not do it anymore. That, another word for that is repentance. Wouldn't you say it's similar to repentance, renounce and repent? Were you going to say something, brother? It's, just repent. it's a repentance. It's like, I repent from that. Let me ask you a question. If you have a habit of being harsh with your wife, do you just have to repent once from that and that'll do it? It's a silver bullet, right? I went to Bible study and it was awesome. From that moment on, I was never again harsh or I never again murmured or complained. No, what do you have to do if you really mean to renounce wickedness? You have to change your life. It's a lifestyle change. You're going to have to basically go to war. It's going to be a campaign you're going to have to wage. And five, ten years from now, you're still going to be working on it, but you'll be better at it. That's what's going on. And how much wickedness are you supposed to renounce? All of it. All of it. How much will you renounce? Not all of it. And, and the reason is you won't identify it all. You won't see it. You'll have blind spots. You'll have areas you just didn't see. They're called, there's blind spots. Now, Lynn, you're right. If you're in a good church and they do watch over one another in brotherly love, they'll identify some of those blind spots, but it's, it's hard, okay? Uh, somebody read, we're in, in Titus 2. Uh, read the last verse of the chapter. Verse 15, just verse 15, just read that. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Okay, look at all the verbs that Titus is supposed to do, Chris. What is he telling? What is Paul telling Titus he needs to do? Declare. Declare these things. And what else? Exhort. exhort. What does that mean to exhort? Encourage. Strengthen. Yeah, it's stronger than encourage. It's like get going. It's like a kick in the tail a little bit. I think an exhortation is you get moving. All right? So that's exhort. And what else? Rebuke. Oh, wow. There's that word again. <laughs> What does rebuke mean? Authority. With authority. <laughs> all authority. With all authority. So Away from I, it's like I'm not sure I'd want Titus as my pastor. I mean, he's coming after me, you know? <laughs> I don't know, but but I think what it is is I think you earn the right. Like you remember how the apostle Paul, when he told the Ephesian elders that he would they would never see him again in this world, do you know what they did? They wept. It broke their hearts that they would never see Paul again. And he's the one that wrote these words, rebuke and exhort with all authority. Jesus said the same thing to his disciples in the Gospel of John. Yeah. Did Peter hate Jesus for saying, get behind me, Satan, to him? No, he didn't hate him. It was stung. I'm sure it stung. But he didn't hate him because he knew he was right. So I think what it is is if you're a good pastor... You earn the right to do this kind of thing. It's hard to do, but it's like, and that's why I think that it's ridiculous the average length of pastor it's being two years or three years in a Baptist church. You can't earn the right in two years. They barely know you. See you know what I'm saying? So the idea is you got to get up to that plate, place and earn the right. But still, this, this verse says it. So this is going to be a lifetime work on renouncing wickedness. And root. Uh -huh. to that weakness of that husband yeah. that is harsh with his wife is a, is a root problem there. What is it? It all goes back to not living according to this scripture, yeah. not understanding salvation, right. not understanding sin, not, not staying in this word, Amen. not learning. And, and a man like that can be genuinely justified but have that blind spot or that bad habit. It can be a pride issue um, in his personal. When, when you know that you're right, and my wife tells me this, it must be very difficult to be in white all the time. <laughs> so, this kind of thing can cause problems in here. That's an encouraging woman. Boy, I'm so glad she said that to you. <laughs> rebuking with authority. Uh, brothers, it should draw brothers closer together yeah. and love each other more. That you would love me enough to say, you shouldn't talk to your wife that way. 
Yeah. Here. I mean, really, she draws closer together. Yeah. You know, Pastor Davis, last night I got to watch a, a documentary on the ACC network regarding Coach K and Roy Williams. And he was recruiting an individual, and they both talked about this. And Roy Williams said, We got up and left because of the child was we're talking about their mother. Mm -hmm. Talked about their mother twice. And he said, That's not right. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, I learned a lot from Dean Smith and just to hear him say, we got up and left. He says, you talk back to your mother like that. I'm not going to be here. And that was really nice to hear him say because, you know, I, I, I put up that for almost 30 years. Yeah. And my mother telling me that I was going to be just like my father. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, no, I'm no different. A lot of that's learned. I mean, it's, there's a whole saying, you can't run where you come from. Yeah. Learn, you have to be aware. And that's hard to change those yeah. learned things that you're raised with. Yeah. It's also being obedient. Yeah, I, I think that we're right. You're right. You get immersed in it. You know, the old statement, does a fish know that it's wet? And it's like there, you can just go many years not seeing sin patterns in your life. But if you're a genuine Christian, you've renounced all wickedness. You're against wherever wickedness can be found, that you're going to fight it. But you have to be educated and trained on where it is. Chris, what are you going to say, brother? Can we go back to grace? Yeah. Um, please. Because all this talk about how we talk to our wives and things, yeah. I'm hoping yeah. in grace that when we get to heaven, right. we'll never say another hurtful word to our wives. We'll right. never say another stupid thing to them. Right. That's true. And thank you for doing that because... The fact is, you, if you're a Christian, you will someday triumph over every sin pattern in your life. You know, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. You're going to triumph. And what that does is it gives you hope while you fight those sin patterns now, right? Every effort you make to fight the sin pattern is, is an effort in the right direction, the winning direction. So you're going to triumph over these things. So the grace of God is greater than this. And the beautiful thing here. And this is combining the insights from Romans 6, which is the great emancipation proclamation on sin. We, if you are a Christian, you have been united with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection, meaning you can say no to any and every temptation the rest of your life. No temptation will ever come to you with compelling force that you could not resist. You theoretically could be perfect the rest of your life, if you're a Christian. That's what Romans 6 is saying, all right? You are not a slave to sin. You have the ability to tell it no. Every temptation you can say no to. That's This doctrine, this verse is saying the same thing. The grace of God teaches you to say no to temptations, to ungodliness, and wickedness. Yeah. Andy, um, I remember there's a phrase, I think it's part of the Latin, but, um, anyway, I think it, it means uh, it's possible not to sin. Uh -huh. Before it was not possible. Yeah. Yeah. And then after being and born again, it's pop. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's Latin phrases that go with it. Yeah, but it is possible for us not to sin. Um, and so fundamentally, you need to know that. When a temptation comes your way and you identify it as a flaming arrow from the evil one, a temptation, you are able to tell that individual flaming arrow. No, you're able to lift the shield of faith and extinguish that arrow of temptation and tell it no, because you are a son of God. You're a, a child of God. You're adopted son of Christ, and you, you are living, you can live a holy life. You can tell any and every temptation no. If you deny that, if you say that's not true, then you would rightly be able to say that that particular temptation was impossible for me to refute. And God will uphold that. Say, you're right. That one was different. You, you did not have the ability to say no to that temptation. The Holy Spirit will never tell you that. Ever. So you are actually able to stand firm against any and every temptation the rest of your life. So that's its partner. Romans 6 in this is teaching the same thing. The grace of God that brings salvation teaches you to say no to sin, to ungodliness. To say no is like, I'm not going to do that. It's basically like Joseph and Potiphar's wife, right? She comes after him. What did he say to her? 
you could sum it up in one word, what would it be? No. <laughs> okay, let's, let's just keep it simple, all right? No. But the words he actually did say was, how could I do this wicked thing and sin against God? And he also sinned against Potiphar too. I can't do that. And so that's his mentality. He's, he could say, say no to that. Any other thoughts on this? It teaches us to say no to ungodliness. I think it's interesting that it's so encouraging to whatever sin you're struggling with. It might be you know, the lust or it might be profanity. It might be gluttony. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you talked about you know, different things. You could just substitute those sins into the words ungodliness and worldly passions and just say no to them and, and then focus on eager to do what is good. It's just, it's just kind of uh, good general encouragement for even specific things. Amen. You know, you, uh, as you were talking, Chris, I was thinking about, like, soldiers that battle in, in, in war, and they'll use um, propaganda. Like, um, who's that, that woman that used to, uh, Berlin Betty or something like that, or Tokyo? Hanoi. Tokyo, Hanoi, yeah, all these. Well, not, not yeah, I, I would say... These were, but maybe her. I don't know that much about her, but there was Tokyo so-and-so, Rose. Right. And what do they say? You're going to lose. Right? You're going to lose. So what should I do? Oh, my goodness. What am I going to Stop fighting. Well, it'd be much to the Nazis or the, the Japanese imperial army's uh, advantage for you to stop fighting. That's the very thing they want. Same thing with Satan. He wants you to stop fighting his temptations. Well, if you stop fighting, what will you do? You'll yield to them and die. You will sin and die. The wages of sin is death. You can't stop fighting. So therefore, essential to fighting is believing you can win. Filled with hope. I'm going to say no to all those. I'm going to say no to ungodliness. I'm going to say no to that. So Chris, you're saying that very thing. You're enslaved to a certain pattern of sin. You, you, you think, and it's like, no, I'm not. I'm, a, I'm set free. I'm a child of God. I can, I can break free from that. I don't ever have to do that again. That's essential to winning is believing that. And it's doctrinally true. The Bible's openly telling you that it's true. So the grace of God teaches you to say to no, no to ungodliness and worldly passions. That's what my translation says. What does your say, ESV, again? 12. Worldly passions. What does that mean? Worldly passions. Worldly desires. Desires. All right. Worldly desires. Worldly passions. What? Greed. All right. Selfishness. So what's the difference between a, a worldly passion and a worldly action? Worldly well, passion is that which is acting on us, but it doesn't mean we have to act upon it. All right. So before, would you say before a wicked action, there was a wicked passion or a lust or a desire? Yeah. It all starts, and James says this, sin begins with desire. It begins with an evil desire. There's something in the heart. So this is cutting the thing, nipping it in the bud or cutting it at the root. It teaches you to say no to the, the worldly wicked passion. So that's all about thought control, isn't it? Don't you have to control your thoughts on this? It's got to do with the thinking that, that you do. It's like, I'm going to think pure thoughts. Like Philippians 4, um, uh, 8 says, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, that's what I'm going to think about and nothing but that. So that's what the grace of God does. It teaches you to do that. It trains you to do that. Um, and it says to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Now, these words should seem very familiar. We keep bumping into this issue of self-control. Uh, didn't we see it in verse 9? I think it was verse 9. No, 6. I'm wrong. Verse 6. Somebody read 2, 6. Remember we went through older men, older women, younger men, younger women. What was the, the counsel to young men? You guys remember? Be self-controlled. What else? Just in Titus. What else did he say? That's it. <laughs> Is that the whole thing? No, there's other things to say to young men. But here in Titus, that's all he says. What is it? And we talked about this many times, but we're coming up to this again. What is self-control? That the drives... The drives of the flesh, you're saying no to that. Taking control over the drives of the flesh. Yeah. Take, taking on authority. Right. This is 1 Corinthians 9. We've talked about that before. Paul says, I beat my body and make it my slave 
lest after I've preached to others, I myself might be disqualified. Now that's NIV. Other translations are, you know, it seems very harsh. But without getting into the, the nitty gritty of the image of beating your body and making it your slave, what, what, is, what does he mean by that? I beat my body and I make it my slave. Make it obey. I make my body obey me rather than me obey my body. Control of my desires, my passions, my, my body. I can say no. I can say yes. I can yeah. live this godly life. Yeah, and so, so fundamentally, your body will have a drive in some direction, and you're going to say no to that. So let me ask, just in general, the discipline of fasting. How would that help build self-control, fasting? You learn to tell your body that you, are, you, you really aren't hungry, you aren't eating now, and for me, I have to go to prayer. Okay. The body doesn't let up to it. Yeah, and frequently they're linked, fasting and prayer. So a lot of times it's good, it's a practical thing. If you don't have to eat a meal or prepare a meal, you got more time and you could spend it praying. But it is a display of self-control, isn't it? Fasting is a picture of self-control. So your stomach's growling, ordinarily you'd feed it, and you're just not going to. And you're like, I'm in charge of you. You're not in charge of me. Now the opposite extreme would be uh, the pagans in Philippians 3 whose God was their stomach. Remember that? So what does that mean that their God is their stomach? They follow the orders of their God. Yeah. Their body, when their stomach grumbles, they feed it. And that gluttony, and I think it, it's a metaphor also for sexual immorality. You know, the stomach is like, like a lust, a desire. And so they're sexually immoral. They're pursuing sexual drives. So self-control is I'm not listening to my body. I'm telling my body what it's going to do. I'm not going to give in to that. So that's the idea of being self-controlled, saying no to drives, um, to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives. All right? So again, you see the beauty of this. The grace of God in this Cretan church, church planted in Crete, pro should produce this kind of person. See what I'm saying? It should produce the kind of person that lives this kind of life. It says no to ungodliness and wickedness. They live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives, it says, in this present age. In the Can I ask you a question? Yeah, please. I'm, a, I'm a little bit tunnel vision right now okay. on the stealth part. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit later, but the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But what's the connection between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and self, whatever, self control? Yeah. Well, we've asked that question because I have that question too. We, we d dug into this a little a week ago. What did we come up with? The relationship between the Holy Spirit, indwelling spirit, and the virtue of self-control. How do you connect those? Well, the power, you know, the Holy Spirit is the entity with power. Right. The power for us to uh, have the strength and the guidance and the desire to do those things you talked about. Okay. This comes through the Holy Spirit working okay. in us and our minds, our hearts. Yeah. Alan? Uh, the Holy Spirit is our ally as we wage war against our Romans 7 self. Yeah. Yeah, and we know from Romans 8, it says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you, by the Spirit, put to death the misdeeds of the body, you'll live. So doesn't that teach a partnership between you and the Holy Spirit in putting to death the, the deeds of the body? It's you pl plus the Spirit. It's the Spirit plus you. It isn't just the Spirit. And it isn't just you. Just you is moralism. It's you being a morally upright, virtuous person by your own goodness. That's not the Christian life. But it's not just the Holy Spirit either. Every time a Christian sins, they prove that. Was it the Holy Spirit's fault that that Christian sinned? What do you guys think? You guys, anyone want to join me in saying that was definitely not the Holy Spirit's fault? So then it is a partnership between the Christian and the Holy Spirit to mortify the deeds of the flesh. So the Holy Spirit works it by first, we've been saying, giving you good sound teaching, good instruction, 
diagnosing what wickedness is, telling you what the issues are, and then urging you to make a, white, a wise decision, a, 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 a right and a wise decision. But you got to do it. Your job is to kill that sin. That's your job, not the Holy Spirit's job. His job is to empower you to do the killing. But you got to do the killing. This came up in um, Matthew 12 when basically Jesus is teaching about an uh, evil spirit. And he says, when an evil spirit comes out of a man, he goes to every place and seeks and rests does not find it. And he says, I will return to the house I left. That empty house that he left might be empty now because the person has been trying to clean themselves up. They've been trying to fight you know, this um, unrighteousness and all in their own strength and their own power. If they were truly a Christian, the Holy Spirit would dwell there. And when that Spirit came back, he would not find that house empty. He would find the Holy Spirit there and probably wouldn't reside. So the Holy Spirit is is uh, uh, that particular verse hit me just because I need that Holy Spirit indwelling in me because I can't, I can't achieve this spiritual righteousness by my own power, and I can't fight off the, the power of these demons without the Holy Spirit uh, to help me. It's a great insight that you know that unoccupied aspect. The Spirit's not there, but we're talking about a mysterious partnership between the born-again Christian, the born-again believer, and the indwelling spirit at a specific moment of temptation or with a specific habit pattern of sin, they're working together. It's a cooperation. Another good example of the cooperation is Philippians 2, 12, and 13. And let me just quote it to you. Philippians 2, 12, and 13 says, As you have always obeyed, not only my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to do according to his good purpose. Now, that is a mysterious cooperation passage. You're supposed to work out your salvation with fear and trembling because God is working in you to do it. So who's doing the work? We both are. God's working and you're working. And how does he work in us to will and to do? Before that, I would say he educates, right? You have to know what the sin pattern is. We're talking about complaining or being harsh with your wives. He educates you by the word of God. He shows you a sin pattern. And then he works in you to hate that sin, to see it as destructive, to say, you know, actually, I am to blame for a lot of the conflicts with my wife. It's my fault. It's not her fault. I'm not saying she's sinless, but in that matter, it's me. And I need to do better. That's a sin pattern that needs to change. I need to put that thing to death, but I can't do it. I have so many habits built up in this area. What do you do next? You pray. Don't you? I mean, if you get on your knees and say, God, I am a weak man. I'm a, I'm a habitual sinner. I don't want to be that kind of a husband. Would you please work in me? Would you make me delight in Christ-like kindness? Would you make me love my wife like Christ loved the church? Would you please work that in me? I think that's how it works. And then when the moment comes, you do how you do. And maybe you do well. And then you go back and thank God and give him the glory and the praise. And maybe you do poorly. And you go and confess it as sin and repent and pray some more. That's what the battle looks like to me. That's what I think the battle looks like. And it's a habitual pattern that goes on over years. It takes a while. Does that make sense? So that's how I think the partnership works. All right. We're out of time. So any final comments? Are you working our way? That's it. Lynn, would you close this brother in prayer? Father, we do thank you for this time we've had together. We thank you for the teaching that we might go forth and live on godly lives. And ask forgiveness and know that you are faithful to stand with us and to forgive when we confess our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.